Hi, and welcome back to the Virginia History Podcast. In the last episode, I left off with the English trying to secure backing for a second expedition to Virginia. After Raleigh secured backing for his second, more serious colonizing attempt, he began organizing his resources into a much more permanent endeavor. Raleigh wanted to go on this journey, but Elizabeth soon stood in his way. He eventually relented under her pressure and had to find a replacement leader for the expedition. Raleigh, however, didn't have to look far, as another cousin, Sir Richard Grenville, was chosen for the job. Grenville seemed a decent, logical choice to take charge. He was a relative, fought against the Turks in Hungary, attempted to circumnavigate the globe, though Elizabeth chose to back Sir Francis Drake instead, and otherwise held high standing in Elizabeth's court. But though Grenville had many good points, he also had a couple of drawbacks as well. First, he was known for being extremely arrogant, and second, he was also along for the journey to seek his own personal wealth and glory. Both points illustrate reasons as to why he made a number of seriously detrimental decisions during his tenure. Grenville presided over seven ships, one of which was Elizabeth's own Tiger and 600 men. Philip Amadas, now stylized as the Admiral of Virginia, was to manage the colony's defenses. Arthur Barlow also sailed again as he captained the Dorothy. Simon Fernandez, Thomas Harriet, John White, and the natives Mantio and Wanchese returned on the mission as well, and accompanying them were various seasoned military officers such as Ralph Lane, who had long served with Grenville in Ireland, the veteran privateer John Clark, and scores of other sailors and artisans thought to be needed in order to plant a more permanent colony. Upon first glance, it seemed as if this voyage was certain to successfully establish a permanent settlement. Some of the right types of settlers were on board, but two clues allow moderns to speculate about true English motives. First, there were no women. How would an English colony survive and grow without women? Second, Raleigh sent miners and mineralogists under Joaquin Gans and Daniel Hochstetter's leadership to the New World. It was reasonable as they hoped precious metal wealth was to be easily discovered, but such concerted effort to find these metals often clouded common-sense judgment. Such facts seem to lend credence to at least two prominent theories. Namely, this colony was not meant to be permanent like the numerous Spanish New World outposts. Instead, it was to be a warring base for privateering exploits against the Spanish merchants. If this were true, it would mean that no women were needed. In fact, women would be a hindrance to the cause. Secondly, mineralogists being along for the ride seemed to indicate that the English were not only looking to steal wealth from the Spanish, but also that the English were looking for their own individual, personal treasures. After all, weren't the colonists told of wealth to be had further inland? Such a personal attitude, though not necessarily wrong, in fact, seeking wealth for oneself would fuel later economies, but this was mercantilist, collectivist England, and such attitudes torpedoed mercantilistic missions like Sir Walter Raleigh's. We can't know Raleigh and his group's mind with accurate certainty. But under these two theories, the colony appeared doomed at the outset. As events unfolded, these theories only seem increasingly factual. But enough theorizing for now. What actually transpired from April 9, 1585 onward after the flotilla set sail? A week into the trek, a violent tempest sank one of the pinnaces and scattered the remaining ships at sea. Grenville, after surviving a few stormy days, eventually sailed for the originally intended goal, Puerto Rico. England and Spain were not yet at war. Though tensions were strained, it was not uncommon for English ships to dock near Spanish overseas territories. Grenville's men came ashore on May 11, 1585, and were treated quite well after an initial Cold War standoff of sorts. Just in case relations might not remain casual, Ralph Lane was employed to build a fort at Guayanilla Bay where the English would await the remaining ship's arrival. After eight days, the Elizabeth showed up, and another pinnace was built by the crews to replace the one lost in the storm off of Portugal a month earlier. Grenville now had a tiny fleet at his disposal. He remained untrusting of the Spanish, who had promised to provide requested food and supplies after the initial English arrival. When those goods were not produced by a certain time, Grenville ordered the woods around the fort at Mosquito Bay, as well as the fort itself, to be burned, much to Ralph Lane's chagrin and outright anger. Eager to keep moving and desperate for more supplies, however, Grenville fled the island and led the now three ships from Puerto Rico to Hispaniola in late May. Along the way, Grenville captured two Spanish vessels. One was a frigate, and the other was a vessel loaded with various treasures just off the coast of Cape Rojo, Puerto Rico. 
Information gathered from the Spanish sailors aboard the captured frigate influenced Grenville's next plan. He needed salt, and Cape Rojo was Puerto Rico's largest salt field. Grenville, further driving a wedge between himself and Ralph Lane, promised the fort builder that no Spanish would harass his mission to obtain salt. He ordered Lane to build a fort, which took three days to complete, but it was done under extreme duress, as the Spanish soldiers in fact did inhabit the area. Lane, frightened, soldiered on with his 30 men, six of whom were from the captured Spanish ships, and collected the necessary salt before returning back to his ship, where he remonstrated with Grenville for his dangerous prevarication. Nonetheless, the English soon moved away from Puerto Rico. They arrived at Isabella Hispaniola on June 1st, and ostentatiously anchored amongst various Spanish ships. Grenville led his men ashore and demanded to meet with the Spanish leaders on the Tiger. Eventually wary, the Spanish did come to meet with the English, who by this point had begun undertaking a building project to support a feast. Two houses were constructed on the beach, and the English began providing food in an elaborate manner, which pleased the Spanish, who then brought livestock down from the mountains amidst the party atmosphere. The Spanish, who now thought well of their English counterparts, agreed to trade. But it was another Grenville ruse. What they did not know was that the English had tricked them by using stolen Spanish goods to support the trade with the Spanish. In fact, the English kept the most valuable items for themselves and added more to their stockpile before leaving the island after trading for one week. The motley fleet of now five ships, the three English plus the two captured Spanish, sailed northwestward to the Bahamas, where they stopped for a day to hunt seals. After their hunt proved to be a failure, the ships continued northward along the American coastline, and by late June, the English came near Cape Fear, North Carolina, where more disaster struck the expedition. Simon Fernandez, the supposedly skilled Portuguese pilot, steered the Tiger onto a sandbar near Wokokan Inlet, perhaps near modern Ocracoke Island. The crew worked hastily to repair the damaged ship and move her off the sandbar. But during the two hours needed to complete the task, waves battered the crippled vessel and destroyed much of the wares traded for back in Hispaniola. Grenville was livid, but he had learned a lesson. The larger English ships could not navigate the Carolina Outer Banks. From that point forward, he would only send smaller ships to explore the maritime North Carolina region. Under these new exploration guidelines, Grenville dispatched a small group northward to Roanoke Island in order to meet with Wingina and gather any information about their missing English countrymen. While this mission was underway, Grenville's men in the south reported that two more English ships, the Dorothy and the Roebuck, were spotted sailing off the Outer Banks. Once they had arrived, Grenville had to turn his attention toward building shelter on land to support the mission. The Secotan native, Mantio, was then commissioned to lead an expedition throughout the Secotan waterways and townships along the Pamlico and Albemarle Sounds. They set out on July 11th and had provisions lasting for a week. John White was along for the ride, and he produced some of his most famous work from this trip, which also allows us to know a little bit about what transpired, as he painted many watercolors and kept a somewhat terse journal. They first arrived at Palmioc, where the Secotans welcomed Mantio, Grenville, and his troop. From there they ventured to Aquascococ on the next day, where the English attempted to learn more about precious metals being in that area. They set about doing this by showing gold and silver in various forms to the Indians, who apparently kept one of the English silver cups. When the English discovered that the cup was missing, Grenville demanded that the cup be returned. Either lying or not knowing what Grenville was talking about, the cup was never returned. In order to make a statement of strength, Grenville ordered the village and the surrounding cornfields to be burned down three days after the original encounter. This event was the beginning of the end for the 1585 expedition. When Gina and the Secotans no longer trusted this English crowd. At the same time, the Indians understood that the English had an Achilles heel. They needed food. The English had to rely upon trading with the Indians to supply their sustenance. But the region being explored was suffering from a severe drought and the Indians could little afford to feed themselves as well as the English. Regardless, when Gina the Secotan Werowance, or leader, decided to bide his time and remain peaceful, while Grand Ganymeo, his brother, and Ensenor, his father, both of whom supported the English, were still alive. Once supplies began running low, the English, after exploring quite a large swath of land, returned to their larger ships anchored near Wokokan Inlet on July 18th. Three days later, they sailed to Port Ferdinando in order to plan for a more permanent settlement that was being negotiated between Grand Guinameo and Grenville. Once the accord was signed, 107 men under Ralph Lane's management were transported to Roanoke Island, 
where Lane began constructing houses and a fort, as well as enclosures for livestock and a smithy house for the mineralogists to test local metals. While Lane was constructing this settlement, Grenville still hoped that he could find some semblance of precious metals within the region. To satiate his curiosity, he sent 20 men under Philip Amatus leadership to re-scout the Albemarle Sound. Amatus did not discover much for Grenville's pleasure, but he did scout the Choan and Roanoke Rivers, which were intriguing to the English back home as a potential better inland base for the colony. Also, while on the separate mission, the English attacked and destroyed a number of Weapemiac villages, killing at least 20 men and selling many women as slaves to the Sacatans, perhaps as retaliation for the events that had occurred during the 1584 expedition. All of this was much to the Secotan's delight, and such actions helped ease Wingina's attitude toward the English, at least for the time being. After Amatus returned, Grenville seemed pleased with the colony situation, and he sent John Arundel back to England to report good news. Soon thereafter, Grenville and John Clark, along with John White and Thomas Harriet, would also leave Virginia behind in late August and early September, respectively. Six days into his voyage back to England, he came across a Spanish merchantman near the Bahamas, the Santa Maria del Vincente, and engaged her in an encounter. The Spanish captain quickly surrendered after suffering several casualties and one fatality. Grenville then had to figure out how to get to the defeated Spanish vessel, because he had left his longboat back in Virginia, as it was more useful for navigating the shallow inlets of the region. He concocted some sort of makeshift rowboat out of sea chests that were used to transport 30 sailors across the Atlantic Ocean to the prized Spanish gem. The English, afraid for their lives, made it to the Santa Maria, just as the sea chests sank. Grenville did indeed strike it rich, as the total plunder amounted to approximately 300,000 pounds. When Grenville arrived back in Plymouth, England, aboard his captured prize, he was the talk of England, but not for his work in Virginia. Meanwhile, Ralph Lane was now in charge at Roanoke Island, and all seemed well, especially as the hated Grenville was gone. But the Indians began growing weary of the English by the fall of 1585, although Indian opinion was split. Gran Ganimeo, Ensenor, and Mantio argued for the English, and Wanchis argued against. Wingina remained unsure, and Gran Ganimeo, initially happy with the English, also began to worry. The English were also growing restless because their food supply was growing low. When winter appeared, the colonists were starving. They had hoped to be resupplied by the remaining ships that sailed with them in April, as Grenville promised, but none arrived. Under pressure, Ralph Lane during this time acted swiftly and organized an expedition northward into the Chesapeake Bay region beginning in November. Philip Amatus, now apparently Ralph Lane's second-in-command, led the jaunt northward toward the Lynnhaven Bay in present-day Virginia Beach, and from there ventured around toward the Elizabeth River, where he encountered the native Chesapeake town of Skikoak, apparently the greatest town of the region. It was a disappointment, yet the English set up camp outside of the village for a few months and used it as a home base from which they continued exploring land along the James and York Rivers. Eventually, Amatus and his crew returned to Roanoke Island in February 1586. When they did, the situation between the English and the Secotans had changed drastically. After a comet passed through the night sky and an eclipse was seen in early fall 1585, it became apparent that something disastrous was taking place across the native civilizations. Many Indians were dying of mysterious diseases that seemed not to affect the English at all. When Gina and his closest advisors took notice, they began talking about destroying their English visitors. But each time the discussions began, when Gina's father, Ensenor, brother Granganimeo, and the one friendly native, Mantio, would dissuade the king from violence. It seems that Ensenor, at least, had convinced Wingina that the English were divine, or at least were some sort of zombie-like beings that could not be harmed by death. However, after Ensenor and Granganimeo died, Wingina threw off such ideas of English invincibility. Wingina would change his name to Pemisapin, meaning one who watches closely. A supposed native cultural action that signified war was coming, and began organizing meetings with rival leaders in order to deal with the English. When Gina, as sneaky as he could be, continued feigning friendship with the English while he was planning their demise. He warned his visitors that they were about to be attacked by Menetonin, the crippled leader of the Choanok tribe, who was also leading with local tribe leaders at his capital. Lane took the bait and headed an army up the Choan River after Amatus had returned in March 1586 to head off the attack. Upon arrival, the English marched into the meeting unopposed and stunned the natives. Menetonin was captured, but what he had to say turned English opinion against their thought-to-be ally Secotans. 
When Jaina had been planning to lure the English away from their fort in an attempt to crush the colony in a two-part attack. But that was not the only information gathered from Manitonan. The Choanok leader also told the English about another distant wealthy region named Chonus Temuatin, which was ruled by a great chief who had many pearls. To reach the chief, the English were to embark with a large army, because the journey would be difficult. Their chief, Wahun Sonokok, Werowance of the Powhatan Confederation, did trade with the white men, but he liked to keep control of his territory with a formidable force. Lane was intrigued, but realized that he had to wait for such a journey. He had more serious problems to handle. Before Lane left, he also inquired about other wealth to be found westward. Minnetonan and his son Skiko confirmed what Lane was asking for, which upon reading their account seems somewhat nebulous at best, and outright lying at least. It seems that the surprised natives were just ready to get rid of Lane's army, which they did by talking about wasador, maybe gold in Lane's mind, but more likely referring to copper in actuality. The Choanox eventually ransomed their leader, who promised to submit under Elizabeth's rule, and Lane left with Skiko and Toa as a safety measure against a supposed Choanox attack. Lane then sent Skiko to his fort, while he, along with 40 soldiers, embarked up the Roanoke River in search of Chaunas Temuatin. He, however, did not take enough provisions for the journey, because he was hoping to trade for food along the way. What he did not realize until a few days into the trip was that when Jaina had told the Indians to withhold food from the English, when Jaina was hoping to starve them to death and his plan was working. One hundred miles upriver, the Mangoks attacked. Lane realized at that moment that he had to return to base camp. The return journey was very difficult because no provisions were had, thus forcing the men to kill and eat their two mastiffs. But they persevered, barely, and returned to their island on Easter Sunday, April 1586. With no other food prospects, Lane made the difficult decision to split his colony into three groups. One was sent to Croatoan, another to Hatteras, and the final to the North Carolina mainland across from Roanoke Island. When Jaina, though unsuccessful at first, felt that he had now had his chance that the English were separated. He called for another council to meet on June 10, 1586, but that meeting never took place. Skiko, the unlikely new English ally, warned Lane of Wingina's intentions, and in late May the English devised their own lie to surprise the Secotans. Lane told Wingina that English ships were spotted, and Lane was going to take men with him to meet the incoming fleet. The fort, so Wingina thought, would essentially be unguarded. Instead, Lane gathered Manio and 26 other men to march on Wingina's capital on June 1st. After disembarking and marching toward the Secotan capital, Lane cried out, Christ our victory, the appointed signal for attack, and began destroying the Secotan power center. Philip Amata spotted Wingina and shot him, causing the Secotan chief to fall down as dead. But during the course of battle, the wounded chief got up to run away. He was chased by Edward Nugent, who returned with the now surely dead chief's head. Upon this act, the fighting ended. The Secotans, both through disease and warfare, were almost completely wiped out as a result. Lane, however, was still uneasy concerning his position in a potentially hostile land. He didn't have much time to think about native problems, however, as news was reported that a fleet was spotted to the south just one week after the Secotan battle. Was it Spanish? Was it the long hope for a supply fleet? It was neither. It was Sir Francis Drake's fleet sailing northward after spending many months plundering Spanish holdings in the West Indies. Drake was coming off of a mixed voyage. He had destroyed many Spanish holdings, but disease began affecting his fleet. Further, Drake could not establish a forward base from which to further plunder the Spanish holdings in Latin America. He had to move northward by April 1586. Lane met Drake on June 8th and began detailing his situation. He needed food and supplies desperately in order to maintain and continue exploring. Drake, who had more than 20 ships at his command, said that he could help out, and was preparing to do so when disaster struck once again. Storm clouds began gathering on the horizon, and winds began to increase. The next three days a hurricane struck which destroyed much of Drake's fleet, as well as provisions promised to Lane. This most recent setback was the last one needed to break Lane and his men's will. With the Indian situation tenuous, no provisions coming perhaps for another year, if ever, and no other options for finding wealth, Lane decided to leave with Drake's fleet. But he had to hurry as Drake was unnerved by the torrent and wanted to flee quickly. They packed up what little was left, and all the remaining colonists, as well as Mantio and another native, Tawaii, left Virginia behind on June 18th, less than one year after they had arrived. Thus, another English colonial attempt was a failure. But like Luttons for punishment, the English famously would return. Thanks again for listening to this podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher, so you don't miss any new episodes.
Also, check out the podcast blog at vahistorypodcast.com, as well as the podcast's Facebook page. Enjoy, and tune in next time when the famous lost colony of Roanoke will be outlined. Do do bad, do 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 do